very special guest uh, speaking with us tonight. So the guest is Jonathan Dawson. Uh, Jonathan is a, um, so his job title is Senior Lecturer in Economics uh, for Transition at Schumacher College, of which you will hear more in his talk, so I should not say more. Um, Jonathan also has, um, he's, he's a teacher and a facilitator within the Schumacher community, but more generally he has, uh, his, his biography uh, shows a, a greater um, sense of experimentation with a lot of alternative um, setups for life that we have explored in our course a little bit. So Jonathan has lived in the Hindu and Eco village in the north of Scotland, one of the biggest eco villages in the, in the world for a number of years. He's, he has written a very important book on eco villages. Uh, he has taken the Pepe and myself to Damanpur uh, yesterday, which is a big eco village nearby. Um, so um, he's full of surprises, and I'm sure this talk um, will be as well. Um, so without uh, further ado, I think I, uh, I just want to read it to um, talk to us about your experience. Thank you for coming. So um, thank you for turning on such good numbers. Um, there's no way I'm going to remember names, so um, I, I'm not even going to bother asking you. But it'd be really helpful to me to know what countries you're represented. So can you just tell me what country you're from? India. 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 Ethiopia. Italy. 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 <laughs> <laughs> We have, uh, I teach an economics class in England and we have one British student. So. Italy as well. Italy as well. Wow. Tunisia? Rwanda. Brazil. Panama. Sorry, Panama. Panama. Italy? Where? Where? Twenty years living in Africa, or living in Africa, or living in Europe, and traveling regularly to Africa. So my heart is a big part of my heart, and who I am actually is from having lived in Africa. Um, I want to begin by saying that um, um, my, as Luigi said, my job title officially is senior lecturer in economics, and I do lecture occasionally, but it's really not what I do. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in language, and the. The gulf, the, the gulf between the words that we use and what we're actually describing, I think, particularly in periods of transition, which you were in the and particularly in periods of transition with a strong, deep social, economic, ecological transition, the gap between the words that we're using and the things we're describing can become uh, vast and can really impede our thinking. Um, so I've just um, I've just finished holding a design program called Beyond Development. So I'm particularly interested in having lived in and spent a long time in Africa and a little bit in Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India. Um, I'm fascinated by the way in which the language and the narratives that we use almost inevitably lead us to the place that we find ourselves, even though it's very undesirable. So using you know, the language of the first world, second world, third world, immediately sets up a, it's coded ideologically, saying there's one legitimate path and it's following the European example. Uh, wealth measured in terms of income, uh, the whole concept of aid, of charity, it kind of, it, it um, um, I, I was really impressed with this story that um, I came across of a, uh, this is gonna feel like it's a complete tangent, but it's actually the same story. Uh, of a tiger in a zoo in Moscow that was kept in a 10 meter by 10 meter cage. Um, at a certain point, the regime, the management regime in the zoo changed and they realized this was not acceptable behavior, that it was completely against the nature of the tiger. So they opened up a much bigger enclosure 
but for the rest of and they took away the cage, but for the rest of its life, the tiger stayed within the 10 by 10. It was as if the cage was still there. And I'm really, I mean, I think that Luigi talked about, I think many other things that I've done other than teaching economics, and one of them is storytelling, and I'm particularly interested in the power of language and narratives to condition and to imprison our thinking. So, um, I mean, it seems to me that very much, in the, I mean, I think generally, but certainly in the field of economics, where the tiger is stuck in the 10 by 10, and the potential for thinking much more widely, way outside of the box, is there. But because we don't have the language and the narrative, there are, there are options and realities there that we don't actually know, we don't see them there. Does that make sense? I mean, I think particularly in the field of development, what's called, that's horrible, what development, what does development mean? I, it's, it's what we call zombie words. In my classroom, we've got a long list of zombie words, which are words that really are dead, but they continue to, they continue to condition the way we think as if they're still alive. And in the field of development, is which um, Okay, so I'm not really going to talk about economics. I'm much more, there's something else I'm really much more interested in. But just a few words by way of introduction about economics is that at the moment, it's a really exciting moment to be working in the field of economics because around the world, I'm not sure how the situation is in Italy, but around the world, there is rebellion that is driven by the students who are dissatisfied with what they're being given. So in Britain, there are organizations, student organizations, one called Rethinking Economics, uh, the Post-Autistic post Economic Society, uh, lots of different student organizations saying they're complaining about what they're being taught in the classroom. And it, but it tends to be that the rebellion, and this isn't just Britain, this is India, this is several countries in Africa, definitely Brazil, there's a very strong movement in Brazil as well. Um, but the, the critique is limited to the curriculum. So they're saying the problem is that we're only being taught neoliberal economics. So we're not being taught the history of economic thought, we're not being taught Marxist economics, Keynesian economics, ecological economics. So the, the call is for a more heterodox, a more getting far more different schools of economic thought. Um, and really the implication is if you change the textbooks, that fundamentally that will be enough to affect change in the direction of the society. And I'm not persuaded. I mean, I think that, that to change the curriculum is important, um, but I don't think, it, think it's enough in itself. And actually I find myself progressively more interested not in the what we teach, but in the how we teach. And that's really what I want to focus on. So, I mean, it's telling that this is, I think, IUC is a, is a fairly radical, in many ways, it's a fairly radical education experiment. And still, we're in a place where the tables are nailed to the floor, and you're there, and I'm here. And, and so already the frame is set in terms of expert students who are listening, uh, this doesn't lend itself to cooperation, it doesn't lend itself to dialogue. You know, there are many ways in which the, the pedagogy of the architecture already is speaking volumes. So, you know, just as I'm fascinated by, like, it's really the, the, the hidden curriculum and the hidden way of doing things and how they condition our thinking that I'm particularly interested in. And I think this is definitely true in the field of narrative and language. It's also, I think, really true in simply the architecture of the classroom and in how we frame the learning experience, which I think deeply conditions what we learn and how we learn it in ways that deeply conditions us in ways that, 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 that are simply not useful for the challenges they have. So I'm just going to hit this button for a minute. Is this resonating? I'm trying to resist the role of being a teacher. It's really <laughs> difficult. So, like in Schumacher College, everything we don't have any we don't have any screws in the floor. It's all <laughs> circles. Um, and and to, to the degree that I actually find this a little bit disorienting, I'm kind of a little bit 
you're intimidating me. <laughs> <laughs> so I tend to introduce myself at Schumacher as being a student at Schumacher College. I mean, this isn't just a play of words. I truly feel like there is a learning community that we create. So when I said that really occasionally I lecture, but it's not really what I do, it is not my self-definition. Um, I tend to use the word I'm an educator. And the etymology of the word education, the educator, is to draw art from. You know, which is, you know, this is not an architecture designed to draw you out from. It's an architecture designed for you buy stuff, accumulated wisdom, um, and and that is simply not an educational paradigm that serves at the moment. So what I want to do is I want to. Um, have you read Ugo's latest book, Ugo and Vitaly uh, Kaplan? Yes. Psychology and law. Yes. Some of you too. Some say, we have a reading group uh, that is starting Monday. Great fact. So I, I actually want to cover similar territory. Um, but I think what he is doing, what, what Ugo and Fritjof and Capra have done for law, um, I'm researching a book at the moment that I hope will do a similar thing for education. So how many people have read Ugo's or, or heard Ugo speak about the book? So most of you, correct. Which one? It's called the Ecology of Law. So, um, so I'm I'm trying to do a similar thing for education as what Ugo and and, and Fritjof have done for the law. So we're locating the moment of disjuncture at the same time in history. So the scientific revolution. Thinkers like Francis Bacon, Galileo, René Descartes, making a clear distinction between human beings and the rest of everything. So the the what I would call the illusion of separation. This is the the, the idea that um, that we live in a dead universe where the only source of intelligence, consciousness, mystery is the human neocortex. All the rest is simply an assemblage, it's a machine-like assemblage that we can be of responsibility for manipulating and dissecting in a, for the satisfaction of human beings. Um, so this is a story, I mean, this extraordinary story of, um, uh, that, that, that Descartes uh, led vivisection classes on live animals. And the screams of the animals as the students cut them open, he told the students, don't worry, they are dead. This is simply the creaking of the cogs in the machine. You know, so it's not screams, and it's not sentient, it's the screams of sentient animals that are suffering. It's simply machines that are taken apart and in the process of taking, taking them apart, the, the cogs are grinding. And this is our lineage. This is the this is the intellectual context in which the intellectual framing and narrative in which we continue to exist today. Um, so this notion that and I mean it seems to me that this story is so deeply embedded in all of us that we can never quite escape it. That this is the sea that we've that we swim in. We're, I think we're at a point where there is the potential of leaving this story and beginning to move into another story. I think we're in a period of exiting one story, but the, other, the new story is still, is still presenting itself. It's still manifesting before us as a path that we can only discover by walking it. But in the, the dominant story that we have inherited, the, the dominant narrative is that we are the sole source of sentience consciousness, intelligence in the universe. Now, this is a story, this is the only story. It's a, it's a story that would have been extraordinary in all previous civilizations, and still for many people, many civilizations around today, this is a crazy story. Um, I, this is a story I shared with, uh, with, with Luigi yesterday, that uh, in this Beyond Development course, um, so the, the idea of Beyond Development is it's, it's, looking, it's making a distinction between development alternatives and alter, alternatives to development. So development alternatives continues to make the assumption 
that the path to this magical thing called development continues to be a path copying the West, moving from the rural to the urban, from the primitive to the technological, and that is the, continues to be the direction of travel. Development alternatives say there are different ways of getting to that goal. Whereas alternatives to development are saying, maybe it's a completely different story. Maybe, maybe we should try to escape the story that there's only one path to development and it leads from the rural primitive to the urban technological. And so one of the stories that really illustrated this change was, and, and the, the kind of the, the epistemological challenge that of the, the changing of dominant stories is um, a team turning up from a ministry in uh, a rural part of Ecuador. And the team saying to the villagers, uh, we want to build a dam, we want to dam the river, you're going to lose some of your land, but at least now you have got electricity, you're going to get schools, you're going to get work, you're going to get health centers, uh, so we want your approval. Um, and the villagers said, come back tomorrow and we'll give you our response. So the team came back, and the response was, we asked the river, and she said no. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a completely other, so this, this idea that, that the community includes both human and other than human species is something that, it, it's a belief system, it's a cosmology that would have been common to almost every previous civilization and still to many people alive today. So it's that measure, it's that kind of, it's that scale of moving, of, of seeing that we're swimming in a sea of concepts and story, of that meta-narrative, and um, that maybe it's not serious, maybe everything that we think is true, if we step back a little bit and take the historical perspective, go, wow, this is just a story. The, somebody who comes to Schumacher College, College in Lock, fellow of the college, is called David Abraham. Uh, he's written the single best book I've ever read, called The Spell of the Sensuous. Um, and one of the things he asks, uh, there will be two little things from this book. One is, um, he talks about the word psyche. And saying that for every generation pre-Socrates, he, he's very learned across culture, drawing heavily on anthropological <coughs> records, that for every generation before the time of Socrates, which was the first, the first generation that was broadly illiterate, or where a critical mass of people were literate. But before the time of Socrates, that the word psyche, or the local equivalent of the word psyche, denoted not the, as we, I mean, when I say the word psyche, I find it hard enough to point to my skull. I think, stop. You know, that, that, that our idea of psyche is the individual psyche. Um, whereas for every previous generation, uh, every previous generation prior to Socrates, the word psyche, or its local equivalent, denoted the air into which all beings have communion. So in other words, the source of mystery, the source of knowledge, the source of wisdom, wasn't locked inside the individual human skull, but rather it was a shared property that all beings had communion with. And you know, I, I sometimes try to make the imaginative leap of just thinking, what would the world be? What would the cosmology be for somebody who believed but actually, the, the source of intelligence and mystery is not locked inside my lonely skull, but is actually a common, it's a common heritage of all, not just living, breathing beings, but the mountain as well, and the river, which is why she had an opinion on the building of the dam. Um, so that, that's one thing from David Abraham. The other is, uh, the other thing I want to draw from it is, um, is this idea that the true measure of the truth of the story is how well that story allows you to live well and sustainably in your place. And he suggests to us that, that actually by that measure that the stories of indigenous people, the stories of, <coughs> of, of mm, shape-shifting, of people moving from one species to another, and of river stalking and tree stalking, is actually, in a more fundamental sense, true. Because it is representing, if only metaphorically, 
the deep interdependence of all species. Whereas our stories, the stories generated by the scientific revolution, of the stories of separation, isolation, reductionism, linear causality, may be true in a narrow, in a narrow scientific sense, but fundamentally at the metaphorical level, and in terms of how well it enables us to live in our places on an ongoing sustainable basis, they're profoundly untrue, is what he suggests. Kind of a playful provocation. Okay, so that's by way of introduction. But I think what, what Ugo and, and, and uh, Fritjof do in their book is they point to this moment of history, the birth of the scientific revolution, and the, the emergence of a meta-story framed by people like Galileo, Francis Bacon, and René Descartes, that continues to be, that, that has enabled us to manipulate, to, to, to divide out and to manipulate matter in, a, in ways that has enabled us to live, like every time I visit a dentist, you know, I give three cheers for fossil fuels and the Industrial Revolution. Um, so it's not, it's not like we're saying that this is a point in history where we could com took a completely wrong turn that we should go back to that point, but rather the part of the price that we've paid is that we're inhabiting a narrative that finds us lonely, isolated, in an otherwise dead world that we continue to manipulate for our own benefit. And they say in their book, and I think it's a brilliant book, I've been reading it over the last couple of days in the cafes of, of Kino, um, that, uh, that fundamentally it's a story that doesn't serve us, that we need to transition to a story of, of interconnection and of rediscovering the consciousness that is innate, the sentience that is innate in all species and phenomena of the earth. So how does this, I, I want to, what, what, um, what, what Ugo and Fritjof do is they say that effectively the dominant story will manifest everywhere in our academic disciplines and in our mindsets and they will particularly the law. I want to look at education. How does this manifest in terms of education? So how it manifests is in an educational paradigm, and I think that this is simply so much the dominant paradigm that we, we, we just take it for granted it goes on questions, that it's largely transmissive. So the teacher is in the role of transmitting uh, knowledge to the students, there is a fixed body of knowledge, and therefore uh, you are tested on your ability to uh, remember and recall what the teacher has given you. Uh, it is competitive, so you're not. It, it, collaboration is called cheating, and you're actually to be expelled. Um, the focus is on the intellect, because the only source of legitimate intelligence and meaning is the left side of the brain. So consciousness. Uh, uh, the subjective is mistrusted. Um, it's silo-based, so different disciplines and different departments. Um, and uh, learning is limited, the idea that learning is limited to the classroom. So now you're studying, but as soon as the bell rings and you leave, the study finishes. Uh, and it's universal. So in other words, the same if you go to schools in Lahore, in Kigali, in, you know, wherever in the world, you're going to find a similar set of knowledge, it's not local specific. Now, it seems to me that this is an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary description, that, that, that's, that, that's simply a description of the educational system, and that it should be so, in retrospect, I find really extraordinary. Just another little personal story here. This, this journey of exploration into pedagogy, into educational philosophy, for me began um, a couple of years ago when I was, I was at, a, at the end of the closing circle at the end of a two-week course at Schumacher College. And at the end of this two-week period, this group of previous strangers, uh, there were a lot of tears. Um, people were really struggling to express the enormity of what they'd experienced. Um, there was a continued use of the word homecoming. Um, I, I mean, it was, just, it was an overwhelming experience for many of the people in the room at the end of two weeks. And for the last 15 years, I've worked five years in Schumacher College and about 11 in an eco village called Fintor in 
in Scotland before that. Uh, so I've really had about 15 years of this kind of closing circle. And I find it, it's quite common that this is how the, the show courses finish. And I sat in this, um, in this gathering um, going, wow, what, what are we doing? What are we doing that is evoking such a strong emotional outpouring of and where people are clearly being deeply transformed. That I'm not suggesting that they're going to go away and they're going to stay at the same level of transformation, but there is there is clearly an incremental gain in which time to come. And it, it, was, it was a genuine a genuine inquiry born in my mind at that moment because being part of the teams that are creating these educational programs, it, it seems like a very, to me it seems like a very simple recipe. Um, like we're not sprinkling fairy dust in the soup. You know, it's a very clear, uh, you know, th th there's nothing magical about it. And in the course of my, of my digging into this question and really asking what are we doing that is evoking such a strong reaction among the participants, the conclusion I've come to is that we're reverting the pedagogy, we're reverting the way that people learn to how people would naturally learn if left, by the, left to their own devices. So in other words, what we're doing appears to be radical and transformative only by contrast to the crazy way in which we do education, and the crazy way in which we normally expect that education is done. And so I just want to, I want to dive into each of these different descriptions, the transmissive, competitive, the focus on the intellect, silo-based, uh, learning limited to the classroom, and it being universal. So we look at each of these in turn, and to compare the conventional with what we're doing in Geometric College. Just give you some examples. But just to, I, I just want to read from this point, I, just the introductory point, that my feeling is that we're not, that, that because what happens is that when, you, when you're the product of a story, it's how you see the world that becomes a new normal. And you need a bit of a shock to go, oh my goodness, this is just a story. And actually, it seems to me as I look at the educational, the dominant educational paradigm, it's profoundly dysfunctional. But because it is the normal, we can't take it for granted. So let me just go through each of these in turn. And I'm going to be creating slightly artificial, like there is, it's, 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 um, I'm going to be creating the two poles of conventional education and what we're doing at Schumacher College. Um, there, are, there are, of course, many points on the spectrum in the middle, so I'm, draw, I'm comparing the two ends of the spectrum, just for greater effect. So, the contrasting, the, the dominant mode, I think, I mean, tell me, is this true here? Is most education here transmissive? Is generally, I mean, I'm guessing it's going to be a little less transmissive here than, than in most places. I would guess that most undergraduates was spent, certainly, when I was an undergraduate, I spent most of my time listening to experts talking at me. Does that continue to be good? I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad. Well, it's great that it's changing, but, but certainly, I mean, the, the very fact that we've got rows of seats facing this way and we're facing this way lends itself to transmissive, and I think it continues to be the dominant experience. Um, and I want to suggest that actually it's a profoundly unhelpful way of seeing it. So the idea that there is a fixed body of knowledge and there is one primary source of expertise who is paid to generously share of his expertise, transmitting the wisdom to the, not the wisdom, the knowledge to the group, is a profoundly unhelpful way of, of describing the real genuine learning process. So certainly if we were in Schumacher College at the moment, we'd be sitting in a big circle. Uh, we'd frequently be breaking into small groups, and I as an educator would be, there are points I would see where I am sitting in knowledge that I need to transmit, and so it's not forbidden to give a lecture, but much more frequently the students are sitting on an extraordinary level of experience, wisdom, gathered over the years, that you're we are tending not to set up education in the way that students can share with themselves, share with each other. So much more, rather than transmissive, much more inquiry-based. I'm going to be talking a little bit 
uh, later about how we pull all the packages of the Schumacher College uh, way of working and work with master's level law students in Belfast, my home city, um, in ways that really, it was, a, it was an astonishing experience watching these students from a very conventional, uh, law is a pretty conventional conservative field, uh, in a very conservative university in perhaps the most conservative city in Western Europe, Belfast. Uh, never heard of Schumacher College before, and we took this package to them. And it was extraordinary at the end of the weekend. I will talk a little bit more about that. But one, the, the seed that we planted was the inquiry, what can you tell about your theory of change from the life choices that you have made? So consider the life choices that you have made and reflect on how, what this reveals about your theory of how things change. So actually, I'm just going to, let's just, let's just uh, move out of teaching a little bit. And, and let me actually go back that question. Just reflect for a moment. Just think back on the choices that you have made in your life, the critical choices you have made in terms of what you're going to study, where you're going to study, where you're going to live, whatever. And just reflect. Um, what do those decisions tell you about how change happens? Can you just put that scene? And that's what we did in Belfast. We used this group of students. So there, was, there was pretty much there was very little content. There was very little new content. But this question was posed. And then we used various ways of working with the question. So it was an inquiry-based method rather than delivering lots of new material, it was planting a question that I'm watching the body language and going, hmm, I can see that. Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, so what about if we spend a week together using different techniques in small groups, exploring the question? Hmm. Hmm. Again, another little thing that comes to me is we have a teacher of action research called Peter Reese, one of the founding figures in the field of action research. And he, he said this wonderful little, this little gem he dropped in class, which is that in his experience, even in areas like economics, that uh, the students tend to choose dissertation and research topics that are related to their own self-healing, about their healing own wounds. So that even in economics, and what happened was that among the students, this was during our research methods seminar, and at the end of the research methods seminar, the students were up for questioning each other. So each was presenting their idea for the research topic, and some other student would always say, hmm, is this linked to an old wound? Can you see something in yourself that needs healing that you're in search of with your research topic? And in almost every case, they said yes. I mean, in other words, I mean, what I learned, what I get from that is that we are, we are self-healing machines. We're continually in search of healing all wounds. And so, and so the idea being that rather than there the being a transmissive of me giving you the information and then testing with your ability to recall and regurgitate that information, that we set the frame with highly intelligent questions in which you can deeply introspect and share with others. And so, shining your own diamond, this, this idea of, of sculptures being, revealing the jewel that's at the center by chipping away the stuff that is superfluous. And so, you're getting a feeling for the difference, the, the difference between the transmissive and setting the frame in which the students can enter into deep exploration using the expertise in the room, both in the form of the teacher and other students, as a resource in, in their own learning process. So that's the more transmissive as opposed to co-produced. So the idea that the students are co-producing and are equally responsible with, with the teachers for the undertaking of the learning journey. Um, I think this is an important point that, that this more transformative participatory teaching method or teaching method, learning method that we're moving towards requires the students to really step up and take responsibility as well. That rather than the teacher being responsible for my grades and for my learning experience, I am responsible for, 
for drawing upon all the resources in the room, including that of the teacher, in pursuance of my own reading quality. So the second point, competitive versus collaborative. Um, um, I mean, for me, it's pretty clear, I, and I'm guessing this is very much a shared experience, that when, when I try and sit and work something out on my own, and then I compare that experience with working with three or four other people in a brainstorming context that the second is consistently more fulfilling. Um, so we, again, set the frame in ways that, so we encourage, for example, for uh, assigned assessments, we encourage group projects that students will, do, will work together. Uh, we've even experimented with group assessments, so having students work on projects in small groups, and then the assessment, a third of the assessment being, I give myself a mark, a third of the mark being my peers, those I work with, give a third of the mark, and that I as faculty will give a third of the mark. Um, of those three, self-assessment, peer assessment, and faculty assessment, which do you think is consistently the lowest mark? Self-assessment. Self 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 yeah. So the, the, the big fear, the big fear is that um, if we lose control, if we give the students the ability to mark themselves, they give themselves 100%. And the you know the consistent finding is that it's exactly the opposite. That we need to believe that we're saying, now you are you are great. Um, but I think that I, of the three, I'm particularly interested in the peer assessment because it provides the students the opportunity of being of honestly being resourced to each other. So, for example, if I've done a piece of work in my peer group, say you were fantastic, it was brilliant. You know, I learned nothing. And it's not really what I'm looking for. Whereas if there's a space where the, my peers, those I'm in the learning <coughs> groups with, can compassionately feed back to me and say, there are ways I think you could have done better, that really builds the solidarity in the group and makes the students much more resources for each other. So I assume this is one more fascinating. You mentioned self-assessment here and also teacher. In my mind, I I think about this, about frames, a setting. I go back to think the market and uh, our work is private by the corporations and by many kinds of institutions. And the value is attached with price, the currency. Okay. And uh, talk about self-assessment. We hope to get more. These corporations is going to give us much money. It could be unhappy. And we think about pay the job and good enough corporations that give us much money. So, to think about this kind of settings, is that kind of different settings, or is it because environments that try to evoke us different kinds of desire, like teachers, peers, we have different kinds of motive, but in the market it's different. How do you think about that? I think that, um, that to introduce this suddenly on its own to a group of students probably wouldn't work. Um, so the way the way that we the way that we work with this at uh, Schumacher College is that uh, is that by the time we get to this experiment is that by the time we get to this experiment with, with self assessment, peer assessment and faculty assessment, we've already built a strong cohesive atmosphere in the classroom that so we're clearly we're saying we're all taking responsibility for the learning journey. Yeah. And so, so definitely in contexts where there is a big reward for students getting a high mark, you need to work with it creatively, definitely. And to do it on its own without already having built a very strong um, a very strong value base of mutual cooperation within the classroom, it probably will work. My question is not about that. My question is that we have sort of an analogy of the environment of that in such dimension here, teachers, self-assessment. How you transfer that like, to another place, like in the market, in the, in the society we live, and how you see that kind of function, how you compare this? That's the question I have. 
Yeah. Well, let me see if I've understood this. Um, but there's a method. Because we desire recognition of the mass. And in my consent, so the, 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 there's some experimentation with, um, if you look at accreditation, like organic accreditation, for example, among farms, mm. um, can be really expensive, so expensive that many farmers can't afford a fair trade as well, a very expensive um, accreditation process. So a number of different organizations are experimenting with peer accreditation. So the farmers are actually cooperating and are crediting each other in the knowledge that if they accredit each other and say fine and it's not fine, they can lose their license if it's a periodic inspection. And so this has a way of using peer-to-peer -peer validation. Um, uh, and, I, and I suspect that um, the digital commons, that the opening up of cyberspace, provides much more opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer validation, cooperation, in lots of ways that we're just beginning to discover. I just want to also respond to what he was saying and I think when it comes to self-assessment even in the market there's quite often a scenario where people undervalue themselves and what they bring to the table and that's often exploited in economies where you don't have good information about what your service is quote unquote worth and it happens a lot which is why again peer-to-peer -peer communication on industry standards, salaries, etc goes a long way towards ensuring equity. In acting, for example, actors tend to get what they ask for. And if you don't know what the next person is asking, you will tend to lowball yourself. And there's a funny story that actually happened. An actress was jealous of another, and she said that she was charging about, uh, just add one zero at the end, right? And she said, because she thought the other person would never get that kind of money and would lose the job. The lady who, was, who did ask for that money didn't know this, but she got um, midway through. So to put it in perspective, one person was getting 1,200, the other person asked for 12,000 and got 6,000. So that was how much she was undervaluing her services. So I think peer-to-peer -peer assessment and acknowledgement of your worth is also really important in self-validation. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think experimenting with all of them, um, they're all worthy experiments. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I know it's time going by, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. I really enjoy this next element because I think it's so important to the learning journey. And that is in the assumption deeply within the, the societal narrative that intelligence is left brain, analytical, intellectual, and that there's no other legitimate forms of knowing. And we uh, are very much part of a tradition that disbelieves that. The thesis has been a very unhelpful part of the story. And where we very consciously invite, in fact, we don't just invite, we insist that the student brings their intellect, their body, their intuition into the classroom. And these are all legitimate sources of information. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in this because I have a deep love of theatre, and I noticed that I try to bring theatre into the classroom, and I noticed that when, when we can find ways of embodying concepts and dynamics and, and situations, that there's a total change in the student's learning experience. So my, my, my initial, my first, my first playing with this was working with ecological footprints. This idea familiar to you? The idea of measuring the, the really composite measures of resource use and uh, generation of waste. And we they're used as a way, it's a really important way of working because, because we've globalized our systems, it means that those of us in the global consumer class who are over-consuming don't see the consequences of our overconsumption because they're felt in poor communities on the other side of the world. So Heavy meat consumption, for example, has translated Uruguay and Argentina into soy, into monocultural, industrial called soy farms, and have turned much of Southeast Asia into monocultural um, palm oil plantations. Now, massively destructive to the communities living there, to the ecosystems, but it's invisible to the consumer unless you really, unless you're determined to find out. 
So the concept of ecological footprinting is a, as a way of, of encompassing being able to track the ecological impact of consumer lifestyles of people in different, in different countries. So we know from studies, for example, that if everyone on the planet had the average, had the lifestyle of the average North American, we'd need five planets. For Western Europeans, it's a little over three. So I would give, I noticed that I would give presentations on ecological footprints with lots of data, lots of storytelling, lots of information, and two things would happen that I noticed. One is that um, within an hour, it was as if I hadn't spoken. It was like a cloud that had passed in the sky and gone. It was a source of clever after dinner anecdotes, but in terms of transforming the person who was eating, very little impact. And me too, I noticed it was a single thing. Um, and the second thing that I noticed is that almost always the student would respond, and I would respond with the intellect, with the problem solving part. Whereas, really, in truth, like you, when you hear or you read about, when you get the data, the information on what we're doing to the planet, like the healthy response is tears. It's like a deep emotional, we're, we're, we're watching, we are colluding in the, in ecocide. And, and the, my, my experience was that as long as we stay at the conceptual, factual level, the students are clever, but they're not wiser. So the very first games that I started developing were, and thankfully they were with international groups in Finborn, so it, it really, it felt, uh, it felt somewhat authentic, is we'd go out onto the village green and we'd make circles representing the size of the ecological space taken by different nationalities. So the North American circle was fingertip to fingertip, massive circle. The Western European circle was still a general circle. We were holding hands, but we were closer together. There was then a circle for Central America, Central Europe, which was tighter, but still not uncomfortable. And then there was the African Indian circle, which was just a huddle of people together. And the instructions just to watch, you know, just get over your discomfort, get over your giggles, and just watch and feed. Um, and almost immediately there were tears and people were, were, were and it's really interesting that, the, that usually every time I've done this, the North American circle looks at the African circle and goes, we feel lonely, oh my God, that looks so intimate. <laughs> Which would give my experience in Africa, it kind of makes sense. Um, but really from that, uh, I think my, my happiest single moment at the college, I'm not sure if this was your, your eulogy, but we had, um, we had groups that, I think it was, we had two, well, we had ten big debates on different subjects at the heart of the new economics. And one's about the commons, the enclosure of the commons, and how we can reintegrate the commons, reclaim the commons. And uh, on day one, we had Pat Comedy, big international expert on the commons, who gave us a learned lecture on the enclosure, of, the history of the enclosure of the commons. And on day two, the students were in control. They, they decided what would happen in the So the, the experts said, but the students were in charge of the process. And what they did was um, the, the, the economics kingdom at Schumacher College is called the Red Room. Nobody touches the Red Room without asking our permission. And the students are generous, so they usually say yes, but really nobody touches that room without asking the economics group if they can use it. So what the students did, there were three students who were holding the session, was they came out of the building at the beginning, at 10 o'clock at the beginning of the lesson, and met the other students and said, we can't use the red room, the college has screwed up its booking, and another group has been given that room, and they've taken our teacher, because they've just completely screwed up the whole booking system, so we've lost our room, we've lost our teacher. Um, and then five minutes later, one came back down and said, um, They've said by way of compensation, if you elect two of your numbers, they can join the group for the day, but, but for the rest of you, there's just a yes. And uh, the students were furious. And I mean, some were depressed and didn't know what to do, and others were really angry. And of course, it was just the end. There was, there was no, and then they went up into the room and realized there was no one there at all. Um, but what had happened was that rather than talking about other people's experience of having their comments enclosed, they had the commons and clothes and felt it in their guts. So it was the, the, the and, and there was the, the, the lesson moved beyond being simply clever 
and filled with facts about other people's problems to being this deeply felt, visceral, angry experience of having our cobbles and clothes. So it seems to me that I, I could talk about this whole area. Um, it could take up the entire uh, the entire evening. But I think just to say that that uh, this idea that that we are just merely thinking machines and that um, the only part of us, the only part that is legitimate inside the classroom and in giving presentations is the cold, rational intellect is a severely dysfunctional belief. So it's something we work on in assessments is um, that if we want to legitimize the subjective is how to accredit subjectivity. We don't have time to, to go into that at the moment, but we give a lot of thought to distinguishing between rigor, what I call rigor, and ranting. Like ranting is being, I think this, I think this, I think this, I think this, and therefore it's somehow legitimate, it's not. But there are ways of rigorously using our subjectivity, of examining our subjectivity, and including that in assessment projects. Maybe something we can talk about in the conversation. Um, Silent based and transdisciplinary, I think this is less controversial as a growing appreciation, even in more conventional institutes, that to be silent based in your economics faculty, your psychology faculty, your anthropology faculty is not really so. So, this is less controversial that there is a, an increasing push at all levels of education for transdisciplinarity. I'm sure you do it here, I'm guessing. So, I'm not guessing. The idea that education is limited to the classroom, again, it's a, it's a very strange conception of education. Right? Education is simply our lifelong learning journey. Um, so at the college, um, the students are involved in growing food, in cooking and cleaning up and washing toilets. This is seen as part of the, it's seen as part of the curriculum. So it's not simply an abuse of cheap labor, it's actually a way of building solidarity and building. But if, if the object of the education is to build not only intellectually clever, but emotionally mature, spiritually mature people who can work together collaboratively in groups, the idea of keeping you isolated and competitive from each other simply is a very strange way to achieve that. Um, finally, universal culture specific. Um, there's a, a tremendous film that's on recently called Schooling the World, um, which is just described, and I really recommend it, it's streamed from the internet, uh, the use of education as a tool for decimating uh, distinctive countries. So this idea that... Um, Um, so the, 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 the idea that there's a standard curriculum that is as applicable in rural India as in, in rural Africa, as in all the different parts of the world. Um, again, the, the, I, I want to make the comparison between, between economic language and anthropological language. Economic language is the language of the, the one legitimate path to modernity, to development. Anthropology is much more generous. Like, so the anthropologist looks at the world and sees a mosaic of beautiful cultural adaptations to the specificity of place. So in other words, the culture in Rwanda is a beautiful and unique adaptation to the specificity of the conditions in Rwanda, as is in whatever region of Italy or India. And so the idea that it is then legitimate and helpful to have an education system that provides identical skills, purely equipping people to survive in the developed industrial bureaucratic society is, is steamrolling millennia of cultural adaptation to specificity. Okay. There, there, there's more. There's more I can say, but I want to leave time for a conversation. But just one. I want to come back to the experiment we ran with Queen's University Belfast, um, where, as I say, none of the students. We've done this for three years consecutively. None of the students had ever even heard of Shimura College. 
um, they were products of conventional faculty in a conventional university in a very conservative city, um, who were used to the transmissive, used to transmissive, saddle-bound, competitive, intellect-focused education, and we brought them in and gave them a week of, first of all, we planted this question, have any ideas come up, and then this has a seat germinated at all, what, do, what does, like the life choices you have made, uh, can they make exclusive what maybe previously was implicit in terms of your theory of change? We kind of looked at that scene at the beginning of the week. And then we brought in a theatre practitioner working with something called Theatre of the Oppressed, drawn from strong Brazilian tradition, Paulo Freire and Augusto Boal. Uh, we brought in someone working with Theory Youth and Presence in the Institute. These are all ways of learning rather than content of learning. They're framing the learning journey, the, the, how we learn, and framing the learning journey in ways that would help the student with this inquiry. And so for the duration of the week, we had these students working in the gardens, cooking, washing the dishes together, uh, taking long walks, uh, going to the pub, singing songs, having deep conversations in two to three, calling on the teachers for specific inputs into the particular questions, and by the end of the week, the closing circle was no different from the closing circle in Schumann the College, of people who knew what they were coming for and were consciously choosing it. And so I just found that so exciting that at the end of the week, by simply, what I said before, that I think that what we're doing is simply reverting the default to how we would learn if left to our own devices. In other words, if we hadn't been polluted by this crazy, insane, individualistic, intellectual, competitive, silo-based ways of learning, which is so contrary to our nature, that within a week of resetting the default, master's law students are going, this is fantastic. Um, for me, it was, was the biggest validation that I've had in in, in my five years to my college. So I just want to conclude with one quote from um, a black North American educator who I really admire called Ben Hooks. And she says, the academy is not paradise, but learning is a place where paradise can be created. The classroom with all its limitation, limitations remains a location of possibility. In that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries to transgress. This is education as a practice of freedom. I'm going to read that again. <clears throat> the academy is not paradise, but learning is a pa place where paradise can be created. The classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. In that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and of our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries to transgress. This is education as a practice of freedom. So just one concluding remark is that I want to go right back to the beginning and say I just to remind you that where I began was that the student revolution, the student rebellion at the moment, is focused on curriculum, which is significant. My feeling is that if we limit the rebellion, if we limit the rebellion to curriculum by replacing one set of textbooks with another, but we don't challenge the <coughs> frankly absurd ways that we have set the frame for education as a as a competitive, silo-based, intellectual, disembodied, de-emotionalized space that actually fundamentally we're going to end up cleverer, but we won't be transformed. And our relationship to ourselves, to our community, and to the ultimate human world will remain stuck in its currently unproductive and destructive
being a big teacher myself, <coughs> I know <coughs> what you mean. The question, the first question of the many I have is just, do you think that there is just the opportunity to give up this type of education and move into a different one? Or <coughs> can we do something to improve what we do in universities, let's say? Uh, <coughs> it would be nice to have time to, to discuss different experiences, but I mean, I'm trying, I've tried to apply <coughs> participatory learning in groups, and it depends on the number, it depends on the people that you can do, <coughs> but it depends also on colleagues. So the question is not a rhetorical one, it's really what in your experience <coughs> have you found? Jonathan, we'll open the floor first. Okay. Let's go. Um, yes. Um, well, actually, I have just some, some questions. Uh, because I'm going through the short courses that the, the Schumacher College are, is offering right now. And I see like shaman's journey, shamanese, mindful walk, body something. <laughs> and. Um, I mean, this is the first time I, I heard about this kind of uh, method of method of education, and I'm quite impressed. <laughs> and I, it's, I found it very interesting, but I have the feeling that it has something to do. It, it sounds like a religion. It sounds like you have to believe in these kind of things. It's not something objective. So I don't know. That is my like. If it, we can call it a critique, maybe, I don't know, uh, of being like very similar to something in what in something like religion. You have to believe in this. I don't know. My question is that, as you said, when we change the passive way of education to a more participatory, the students uh, have, have a lot of responsibilities. So it's it's very hard for the students because when we are here, seated, listening, it's very easy uh, during the classroom. And when we have, when we have to talk, when we are in a circle, we have to talk, expose ourselves. It is very difficult for to to everybody. So there are people that don't want it. There are people that want to be passive. And how how the uh, Schumacher's uh, college deal with it. It's necessary to to be to want to be part of this, or I don't know how how do you deal with it. Can I say something myself? I mean, when well, you kept reminding me of this. Uh, Beautiful line of, uh, in the Dialectics of Enlightenment, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer uh, tell us all of them, uh, you know, uh, of course there is the power of the group, there is the power of the teacher, of the authority, but also there is the power of yourself. You started with this beautiful image of the tiger that then stays there, and at last uh, she got open space. Um, you are going to fall first of all yourself, in your pre-censored images. And the first thing you have to challenge is your censorship. My question is, uh, in your uh, talk tonight, did you have that as a problem, to kind of uh, rebel against your censorship? And did you uh, try to transmit that uh, to us as well? Because that would be a great part, I think, of this, uh, you know, uh, Message you are trying to give us. I have the question. Shall I phrase it again? The question is, you know, if you talk about a different way of educating, so of drawing out of other people in the group, in the circle you wanted to have here. Uh, which was proximally impossible because of the way the, the, the room is disposed architecturally. Um, 
To do that, you have, first of all, to challenge your path of thought to a conclusion that follows a dialectical pattern which the Enlightenment, you quoted at least three of those that uh, Protestant during the Enlightenment, Galileo, uh, Descartes, and uh, Bacon. So um, in this dialectical path, what you do is you, first of all, fall in your pre-censored images of what logic, a logic, should be. Okay? Um, so did you do that? Did you challenge this way, irrespective of the content? I mean, did you challenge this way of proposing to yourself, you know, the things you say, so that you can propose them to us, and you can transmit to us your self-rebellion against your pre-censorship? Am I being clear? <laughs> I'm somewhat confused as well. Okay. I know I'm somewhat confused by you. Are. I well, that is about it. I got what you were asking. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you did. Shut up. This is the, the real point, you see. I mean, if you, if you want to have a new educational environment by which everybody is a subject on a path, you must first of all, challenge the way, your way, of drawing to a conclusion, okay? Of falling to this beautiful final catastrophe, which is the logic conclusion, okay? You close the circle. Have you done that? Have you proposed that to yourself? So that you could transmit it to us. Is this clear? Because uh, at all point of time I do that in the Alexio of Enlightenment, and they managed to transmit it to me, okay? And you should do that as well. I, 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 is this I, I, I suspect it's a great question, but I haven't got it. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a question, though. You know, because it's impossible to uh, ask by the. Can you put it in your Well, I I think what Patrick seems to be suggesting is that whoever we are, wherever we come from, we have a certain frame of reference. And I think what he was questioning was, while asking us to challenge that paradigm in which we see ourselves, have you also challenged your thoughts and conclusions and the box you have created for yourself? The new box. Yes. And are you, were you able to communicate, communicate some degree of how you're struggling with your views and opinions, preconceived or not? Like that box, does it apply to you as well? As, are you pacing within that same thing? Are you trying to break it? Am I right? That, 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 that's kind of what I thought the direction was. Does that sound... Does that sound Absolutely. Cool? The, the lady is much clearer than I am. I'm a certain I didn't get to hear you thrice. So. <laughs> I'm going to start with the easy ones. It's absolutely not a religion. So the, the, there's, no, uh, the, there's no belief system at all. Um, so the reason why you're seeing stuff in shamelessly on the website. So we run master's programs, I look after master's programs, then there are short course programs, these are short course programs. Um, the reason why you're seeing stuff that Shane is on there is that um, is there a really interesting observation is the degree to which insights coming from modern holistic science are matching or complementing those of indigenous wisdom traditions. So this idea, for example, of we asked the river and she said, no, this is a profoundly indigenous shamanic response. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of trying to find traditions and lineages that are coming at challenging the modernist scientific revolution worldview, it's one of the most significant, the, the First Nation original indigenous wisdom traditions. So it's something we're really interested in. Um, but there, I mean, there, 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 there's no, there is a, there is a meditation hall in the in the college, and some people use it, and most people don't. Um, but it's profoundly secular. Secular. There's nothing religious about it at all. <clears throat> um, the first question was, but can you change the existing system? I, I mean, I, I'm really intrigued by how the digital revolution is disrupting every sector of society. And, and um, I mean, most obviously, Encyclopedia Botanica is now history. Kodak history. Like, there's so many 
corporations, so many business models that have collapsed with the arrival of the internet. And I think that the, there is a perfect storm brewing for academia, which is not only the availability of lots of perfect education online for free, but also rising student fees in most countries, and the growing gap which is acknowledged both by students and by potential employers between what employers want and what universities are giving. So, I mean, again, many studies showing that, that employers, potential employers, and this isn't just business, this is across the board, saying that what they want is they want people who are able to collaborate, think creatively, outside of the box, across different disciplines, and this simply is not what universities are giving. So, given the nature of the coming financial, I mean, the coming, the existing financial crisis that will get worse, um, the availability of really good education outside of universities um, and the mismatch between the market, what the market wants and what universities are offering, I think that universities, uh, the current business model of the universities, it doesn't look to me to be viable. So as with, as in, like I'm particularly interested in money systems and uh, there are all the innovation at the moment in the monetary sector is outside of the conventional banking system. It's in cryptocurrencies, peer-to-peer -peer lending, complementary currencies. Um, so much innovation, but none of it happening in the banks. Um, and my feeling is that that um, that uh, this opens the door to a real opportunity for people to begin to reconnect with really asking fundamental questions of what they want from education, and really challenging. Now, can universities change quickly enough? I'm not sure they can. And uh, so given that, I suspect that, that those educators, and it's not lecturers, it's educators, or the ed educators within the system, and I certainly count myself in that among their number, will find places like Schumacher College or other, like this blend of formal and of accredited and non-accredited education, of experiential and conceptual. I think mean, it's a real melting pot at the minute of different things, and who knows where it will go, but within Within classrooms like this, the tables are nailed to the floor, and the teacher is here. There's I teach at Plymouth University and other British universities, and it's a difficult experience. It's difficult, and so there are real constraints on. Um, it's a tanker that was turned down, so, which brings which brings us neatly onto the question of of. Um, the student experience, and if students are passive, if they don't want to be responsible. I mean, my, I, I've got two answers for that. One, the more utopian, and I use the utopian, the word utopian in a very positive sense. I think uh, um, a, a fellow countryman of mine, Oscar Wilde, said, any map of the world that doesn't include utopia is not even worth glancing at. So I, I strongly believe that. Um, so my utopian perspective is that actually what I've described is how we naturally learn. And people, ultimately, when given exposure to more participatory, embodied ways of learning, will naturally grasp it because it's who we are. It's an ontological statement, it's who we are as a species. In the short term, those who don't want it don't come to Schumacher College. So we have a very clear offer, and, um, and we get brilliant students, and they're brilliant because they're they're, it's, they're, they're already committed to whole, burn, whole body, whole person, self-responsible, self-directed learning programs. Almost all of our students, I would say. There's not many who are willing to do that. Yeah, it's a selection of, um, of the student So the difficult one. <laughs> um, I mean, so, I, I mean effectively, what? I mean, I think, I think what can, I, can I say something, Jonathan? You could have chosen to stay there. Instead, you chose to stay here. Okay? First. <laughs> First question. Okay? Second, you chose a path which was logically going to, you know, uh, progressively win by stages and steps. Okay? Again, why would you? You could have made it anarchy. Hmm? I do that. Okay? So, why did you choose a logic path to victory and conclusion? You know. So uh, this is the point I'm making. If you want to have a different kind of exchange in a class, you should first of all challenge the way you exchange. Hmm? 
Don't you think so? I do. I, I gave a TED talk on this subject, mm -hmm. and um, the, all the feedback I got afterwards, most of the feedback I got afterwards was, it was good, but you used the old paradigm to describe the new paradigm by, by talking. Yeah. In other words, you didn't model it. And I, I've spent, I've walked maybe 10 miles there around Torino, and much of that time has been thinking, how can I do this in an hour of the scene? How can I do this in a way that is extremely You can. And I came to the conclusion that given that, that if we were together for three sessions. Oh, now we are going to have a bit deep and you will, as I see, don't worry. <laughs> if, if, if we had three sessions together, mm -hmm. I would have started by consciously disorienting you mm -hmm. because I would have time then, maybe some of you might have back, but I would have started with experiential. Yes. But given given the architecture of the Given the pedagogical architecture and given the fact that we've only got one session together and there are concepts I want to communicate, I chose to do it this way knowing that it was, it was an imperfect way of doing it. Because I'm, I'm not modern. The only bit I found a way of throwing in the same was popping the scene and saying, think about the. Uh, but I, I don't think it was an imperfect way. You know, uh, the, I think it was uh, exactly what we uh, wanted to have. Uh, the point I'm making is that uh, one thing uh, I think um, uh, uh, students, teachers can learn in a critical environment is first of all how to challenge one's own censorship. You know? And this is possible. But this is a critical viewpoint. The critical viewpoint is not external. First of all, it's okay, why is it that I'm taking this position first? Or why is it that I feel this extremely strong desire to belong so that I'm going to agree with whatever position I feel is the right one in this context? You can make it mainstream, you can make it this little niche we have here so that people understand what is expected that they, uh, what is the right thing to say, you know, in this environment, and so on. So this is uh, what I'm saying. And to do that, to do that, you must, first of all, challenge yourself as a teacher. You know, you should have, in fact, physically challenge yourself. The position you have, even in a circle, you see, I mean, it is not that uh, we now scramble all this, and this is going to guarantee you no? And you think so? I agree. And, and uh, real, all I can say is that my, my own natural taste is to seek out views that contradict my own way of confirm. I'm mm -hmm. much more interested in stuff that really challenges me. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, I, I, think that, I think that in the field of education, um, and, and I, I, I hope you see the parallels between what I've been exploring here and what Ugo and, and, and Catherine have been exploring a I think, it's, I think it's a similar story, simply in a different sector of society. And I think that, that at the moment, that definitely the new, what's being proposed as a new paradigm will come under challenge, it needs to come under challenge so that it, it remains live and vibrant and learning and self-reflective. But for the moment, I think the job is simply to, uh, the, the job is primarily to, in a visionary way, describe the new potential paradigm. And then not be close to challenges, in fact, to be really open to challenges. But for the moment, I think the, the challenge is more of communicating in a visionary way what it could be, rather than already trying to knock it down when we're really building that. But in principle, um, I, I have a deep aversion to orthodoxies, and, and the idea that this becomes a new orthodoxy. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? I, I just wanted to, I was very stimulated by this sort of exchange that just happened. So I wanted to add a few thoughts that this is uh, starting me. Um, speaking also as um, someone who teaches in, sort of who has experienced the classrooms at Schumacher College, and then who's teaching in some of the classrooms in this group uh, thing, um, which is that, um, you know, when, when we set up this sort of uh, binaries, and I understand you've done it in order to restore the point, and that's very heavy. At the same time, and this is something I experienced while I was at Schumacher, because it's an environment that is explicitly orchestrated in order to experiment, so these are not there, these are there, that, um, in a way, things are 
somewhat easier there. And I think a lot of people who go through Schumacher then struggle going back to a world that is also populated by things like this, which we may agree or disagree with, but their bodies stand in the way of us wanting to move our body the way we want to. Um, and so with that, I, um, so in my, so in my transition from Schumacher to here, I felt challenged in trying to take out some of that experience from Schumacher and translate it into a space like this. Some of the learning I've done, I've, I've gathered from that, is that even if, so one is the thing that Pepe was suggesting, is the space is made both by the bodies of these things and by the bodies of the people in the place. So depending on, it would be interesting for, I was thinking, for example, that it would be fascinating to see how all the different lecturers move in the space, whether they sit, they stand, whether they sit in a roller chair and move around, which I sometimes do, to try to elicit questions. So even a space like this um, can be populated in many different ways, just like an abandoned building in its verticality can be eaten out by plants growing around it. And so the structure forms gives us a shape on which the, the, uh, some, some organic form can grow anyway. And um, another experiment, and this is a rhetorical question that ends this in, in an in Italian way, Taravici Vim, as we say, is that I, I wanted to suggest that we do something with our bodies at the end of this thing, suggesting also that um, to view that as a continuation of what's been here, which is that when we go for an aperitif together and we sit and talk while eating and drinking and consider and that as, well. as a and consider that an epic for and we consider that <laughs> as our experience. Uh, our friend and colleague Alaji uh, was not able to make it. Uh, he had a great desire to, to make a question and he sent it so I'm not going to read this. No, no. So it goes like this. Uh, critical education theory should evolve from a wider discipline of critical social theory and should look at the ways in which political ideology shapes education as a way of maintaining existing reg regimes of privilege and social control. It should cast uh, a critical eye upon history, the development and practice of education and educational theorizing. I vehemently believe that education in the modern Western world is shaped by the ideologies and power structures that devolve from capitalism and that its purpose is to reproduce these conditions in a way which benefits the already powerful. Instead, radical critical education theory should promote an ideology of education as an instrument of social transformation, as a means of attaining social, cultural and economic equity. Where and, uh, where and which are the apt radical design educational theories, radical educational practice, design practices, radical cultural study models that will, allay, uh, that, that will be able to sustain a radical education process? This is his question. And I would just add a little thing. I would put it in a provocative manner, but then uh, I don't know, uh, maybe, maybe it can be of, of good use. Uh, when you, you, you used at one point the concept of lifelong learning in a very positive sense, as this is a continuum continuous process that we go through. As you already probably know, lifelong long learning is one of the primary concepts of neoliberal education in saying that if you work in a certain place and you lose your job, well, there is this process of lifelong learning and you, you should learn something else and do it, you know, you know be uh, effective in the labor market and such. So I, I'm just wondering about one thing. Is if you propose all this in a way of our own self-enlightenment, so it's a good thing, and we obviously, in a way, pursue it, all of us here. But then, if you think about this in a broader social context, and the change that it, it would spur, which also Alain mentions here, uh, this is something that I wonder. It seems to me that uh, in a society structured as ours is, we can call it capitalism, and uh, with obviously the way that all our resources and skills are focused and channeled toward certain products and certain ways of things happening. Uh, couldn't we imagine a world where we all do this, what you suggested that we do, that we engage in this different type of edu self-educational and educational process, but with one goal, 
also to be valuable to the to the capitalist system and to these newly developed skills which are su such in so many ways different than than the one, ones we, we, we have now uh, used for the for the benefit of further accumulation of capital and maybe even further destruction of ecological uh, uh, ecosystem in the sense that I don't see that there is this inherent link between this type of self-educating which you propose and then not using all of this for, for a different purpose which is obviously dominant in the world that we live in today. Um, I think just following on from that, um, you know, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that um, we are still operating within a market logic. We are saying that we should educate people to be creative free thinkers because that's what the market is looking for. And we could disagree there because having worked in a law firm, I can tell you they're not looking for creative free thinkers. <laughs> but there's also this question about how experimentation tends to hurt those at the bottom of power structures the most in the sense that today we're sitting in a classroom, we're all speaking in English. That already presupposes a certain degree of elitism, but on the other hand, that also allows us to exchange views, right? Very often when we look at very culture-specific, local-specific education systems, which do have a huge importance in empowering people to deal with challenges of their life, we also take away from them the power to challenge and join the existing power structure. Because education is often administered more than you know, really experienced or sought for in a very unique sense. So if I were to teach in rural India solely in the local language, a curriculum that was solely responsive to local needs, I would say, for example, that you could never join, say, the, you know, the levers of power in the country because you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't have the tools of the language to communicate. So I think the power structure issue is one that unless there's change there, it can't only be a bottom-up change, because there'll be this huge mismatch. Okay, I authoritarian the proposal. Those were the last questions. And now, because such great questions. Um, I, I, I have to say, I completely agree. Uh, there's nothing you said about this agree with. Um, and Certainly, like, so you're right that there isn't a logical link between whole personal education and critical pedagogy. We, we need to do both. Uh, but the one doesn't logically lead to the other, it's true. Um, so, I mean, th th there's thinkers like um, um, Henry, Henry Giroux and uh, Paul Freire, who we explicitly lean on. Uh, who say that education is enormous of business, it is about justice, it is about correcting injustice. And uh, action research is exactly the same. And we explicitly draw on these in ways exactly the way that you are committed. So for example, <coughs> every year for the last three years we have brought in, you know, these are economic studies, it's great. We've brought in a theater of the oppressed um, presenter. So the way this works is a wonderful way of working where you explore felt experienced oppression from within the group and from, our, from, with, from within the group you end up the way that we worked is we end up with two stories of felt oppression where the protagonist tried multiple ways to overcome the oppression unsuccessfully so then the students sometimes as professional actors but most of the students then spend a day working on performance of these two pieces and then there is performance in the evening, and the participants of the performance are invited to ask the question: How could the what could the protagonists have tried? How could they have done this differently? And then they usually say, Well, they could have, and they say, No, come and show us. And so you put the play back to the point at which the protagonist thinks something could have changed, and they come in and play the role. And the and then the, the students who are the performers improvise around that, but improvise realistically, like what really would have happened. Um, so again, this is very clearly a tool for moving beyond thinking about other people's oppression to getting an embodied, visceral experience of oppression and not being able to work, not being able to find a way around it. So in other words, that is indicative of the fact that we very clearly bring the normative 
liberatory dimension of education into whole person education. So I couldn't agree with that. Um, and like you, I, I, I really agree with you too, that, um, that it's clear that, again, I want to recommend another very powerful film called Ancient Futures, Learning from the Dak. The Dak, L A B A K P A H. It's a little, it's called Little Tibet. It's in the northern India. It's actually administratively part of India, but it's, uh, it's culturally Tibetan. Um, and it's this movie that shows the process of development and modernization and followed the building of an all weather road into the back. And how in a decade it just lost pretty much all its, its indigenous culture and people in life. Um, and the filmmakers were making the broader point that we Westerners need to watch this because what happened in 10 years in the back that you can really clearly see took 250 years and so we, we don't want to see the whole picture but if we look at the experience of the back we can look at the European experience and go, oh my god, that's what happened. And it really shows that the, like, it shows the role of education in, separate, taking, in, in separating the kids from the woman and taking the men to work, the kids in the school, and the woman suddenly isolated. So the woman played a dominant role 